Hi guys, my name is Jamie Walls Taylor and welcome to Brief Histories. Here on this channel I make videos of fascinating people in history from all walks of life. Don't forget to leave a comment down below if you have anyone you'd like me to make a video on and I will get right on that. But today we're headed to the 1500s to meet the fifth wife of Henry VIII, the young, spirited and naive young queen who shared her cousin's sad fate upon the chopping block, Catherine Howard. Catherine Howard was the daughter of Lord Edmund Howard and Joyce Culpepper. She was probably born in Lambeth, but the exact date of her birth is unknown. Catherine was the youngest of ten children, and she was also a first cousin to Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's ill-fated second wife. Catherine's mother died when she was five, so her and some of her siblings were sent to live with her father's stepmother, Agnes Howard, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. The Dowager Duchess presided over large households where dozens of attendants, along with her many wards, usually the children of aristocratic but poor relatives, resided. This was common practice at the time. But the Dowager Duchess was often at court and her supervision was lax. She had little involvement in the upbringing of her female attendants. And Catherine became influenced by the older girls who candidly allowed men into their sleeping areas at night for entertainment. At 13 years old, Catherine was repeatedly molested by her music teacher, Henry Mannix. When questioned about the situation later, Catherine was quoted as saying, at the flattering and fair persuasions of Mannix being but a young girl, I suffered him at sundry times to handle and touch the secret parts of my body, which neither became me honesty to permit nor him to require. Mannix's interference came to an end two years later in 1538, when Catherine, now aged 15, moved to another of the Dowager Duchess's households in Lambeth. There she was pursued by a secretary of the Dowager Duchess, Frances Dira. The two became lovers, addressing each other often as husband and wife. Many of Catherine's roommates among the Dowager Duchess's maids of honour and attendants knew of the relationship, but Frances was sent away and left for Ireland after the couple were found out by the Dowager Duchess herself. Henry Mannix, likely jealous of Catherine's new relationship, had told the Duchess to visit Catherine's bedroom half an hour after going to bed, adding that you shall see which shall displease you. In 1540, Catherine's uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, found her a place at court in the household of Henry VIII's fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. As a young and attractive lady-in-waiting, Catherine quickly caught Henry's eye. Her youth and prettiness captivated the middle-aged sovereign, and he soon began to shower her in gifts of land and expensive jewels. Henry called her his rose without a thorn, and the very jewel of womanhood. On July 12th, Henry VIII's fourth marriage was annulled, and 16 days later, Henry VIII took Catherine Howard as his fifth wife. For a while the two were happy and Catherine managed to lift the king's spirits. Henry had gained a lot of weight and was dealing with a painful ulcerated leg. And a vivacious young girl brought back some of Henry's enjoyment for life. The politics, war with the French and loss had dampened. But less than a year into their marriage, the rumours of her infidelity began. One couldn't blame her for seeking the company of handsome men nearer to her age. But to do so was dangerous for a queen, even if only in courtly flirtations. And it did not help matters that she had not informed the king of her previous affairs. 
and that she had appointed Frances Derham as her personal secretary. Soon people who had witnessed her earlier indiscretions when she was young began to blackmail her in return for their silence. The gossip circulated and it was soon discovered Catherine was having an affair with Thomas Culpepper, her husband Henry VIII's favourite male courtier. The couple's meetings were arranged by one of Catherine's older ladies-in-waiting, Jane Boleyn, the Viscountess Rochford, Anne Boleyn's brother's widow. Thomas Cranmer built a case against Catherine, which he brought before the king. In November 1541, hoping to prove the Queen's infidelity, Henry was heartbroken. He did not believe the accusations at first, but agreed to an investigation. Lady Rochford was interrogated and for fear of being tortured, agreed to tell all. And a love letter written by the Queen was discovered in Culpepper's chambers. Catherine was immediately put on house arrest. She begged to see Henry, but he moved himself to another location and she never saw him again. Culpepper and Derham were arraigned at Guildhall on December 1st, 1541 for high treason and were both executed at Tyburn on December 10th, 1541. Culpepper being beheaded and Derham being hanged, drawn and quartered. Many of Catherine's relatives were detained in the tower and tried for treason for encouraging him to marry a woman who had illegally hidden her sexual history and for keeping her previous and current affairs a secret from the king. All of the Howard prisoners were tried, found guilty of concealing treason and sentenced to life imprisonment and forfeiture of goods. Though in time, they were released with their goods restored. Catherine herself remained in limbo until Parliament created a new law that could punish those who intended to commit treason such as adultery. And Catherine was officially arrested. When the Lords of the Council came for her, she panicked and began to scream. And she was manhandled into a waiting barge and escorted to the Tower of London. Her flotilla passed under London Bridge, where the heads of Culpepper and Derham were impaled for all to see, and where they remained until 1546, a horrible sight. Entering through the traitor's gate, she was led to her prison cell, and her execution was scheduled for 7am on Monday the 13th of February, 1542. Her only request was that the block be brought to her in advance, for she wished to know how to place herself. If this was to be her last act, she would die with dignity and composure. The next morning, though she was weak and frightened, having to be helped to the scaffold, she made a speech about her worthy and just punishment and placed herself on the block where she was executed quickly in one clean cut. Her body was then laid in an unmarked grave in the chapel of St. Peter and Vincula. Her life was over before it really began, another shoot of tragedy. Learn about more historical figures and follow Brief Histories on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Tumblr. And find out more at www.briefhistories.co.uk. Check out the other videos on this channel and see what you find. Hey there, historians! Thanks for watching. If you like that video, feel free to check out some of the others on this channel. Don't forget to head over to the website www.briefhistories.co.uk to check out all the timelines, family history and more. Thanks very much for watching this video guys, I hope you like it. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more and I will see you guys next time.